Um, keep in mind that it's not a negative amount of energy. What does it mean if delta G is negative? It's not a negative amount. It's right. So it was the change in energy, but again, the change is not necessarily negative either. What does it tell us about the energy? It's the direction. That it's a spontaneous reaction. In other words, negative delta G means the energy is given away by the reaction. And in an intergonic reaction, positive delta G, a non-spontaneous reaction, energy has to be input for the reaction to happen. And this is sort of a summary. Yesterday we did a couple of practice, or you guys did a practice problem with numbers with something that looked kind of like this. So in an exergonic reaction, if we don't look at, we're not looking at actually what all the things that are happening in between. We're just looking at how much energy the reactants have, how much energy the products have. In an exergonic reaction, this would have a negative delta G because energy was given off. The products contain less stored energy than the reactants. And this would be an endergonic reaction. The reactants have less energy than the products. Yes? I could give you a picture like this and ask you if it's an exergonic or endergonic. Absolutely. Yes. So, and remember, numerically, you could also get this with numbers because you would subtract final minus initial. So if you got a negative number when you subtract it, um, like in this case, if you do final, if we put numbers here and this was like, let's say this was 10 and this was 50, then the change here would be negative 40, right? And so 40 kilojoules of energy would have been given off by that reaction. Okay, but this picture doesn't really tell us what's happening as the reaction progresses. We're going to see a different graph, which if you started the worksheet yesterday, you probably saw number seven, had a different graph. We're going to get to that one right at the end today. Now, a closed system, like you do a reaction in a chemistry lab. You basically mix two chemicals together, and the reaction happens, and then the reaction pretty much is finished, or it reaches a point of equilibrium, sort of like with diffusion. You put food coloring in the water, Eventually, the blue coins all spread out. Everything doesn't stop moving, but there's no net change. We talked about that in the previous chapter. When we say, so that's what we mean by a closed system. You mix stuff together and you let it go. You don't add anything else. You don't take anything away. Closed systems, a closed reaction where you're not adding anything after the fact or taking anything away after the fact, will eventually reach a point where delta G equals zero. And when delta G equals zero, there's no change occurring in energy, so we say that no work is being done at that point, which means that in a living cell, we should never see delta G zero because living cells are not closed systems. Right this moment, you're breathing in oxygen, so you're not a closed system. You're taking in a reactant all the time. You're exhaling carbon dioxide. You're also exhaling water vapor. Your cells are constantly, your mitochondria are converting oxygen into carbon dioxide. Your cells are constantly building proteins, breaking down fats, doing all kinds of stuff. So we don't consider living things a closed system. A closed system it would be if we locked you in a jar and you basically couldn't get any new stuff and you couldn't get rid of any old stuff and everything would just build up and you obviously wouldn't live very long under those situations. Even the earth is an open system, right? We're taking in sunlight. We're giving off heat. So anything that's taking in new uh, reactants and giving off products that are being used up and passed along, etc., are open systems, and you should never ever see delta G zero, because it, it, that would pretty much mean no work was being done, and there should never really be a situation where no work is being done by your cells if you're alive. So reactions are something that are happening on a continuous basis. So when we look at those snapshots of intergonic and extragonic reactions, we are just looking at a snapshot for a single reaction. Um, but the truth of the matter is, in a living cell, it's a lot more complicated. There's all kinds of reactions, um, and you're constantly bringing in new reactants and releasing and converting products. All right. Um, so knowing that, here's I, li I like this illustration. <clears throat> so the water moving down, this is exergonic. Right? This doesn't require any energy because basically just because of gravity, the water is going to move. That's going to turn this turbine, and lighting the light is technically an endergonic reaction, but the power generated sort of powers it. So you're using the power of an exergonic reaction to power an endergonic reaction. And that's sort of what your cells can do as well. That you have some reactions going on in a cell that are releasing energy, other reactions need energy. You have the power, or your cells do, to pass the energy on 
just like this, uses this and traps it and then lights the light bulb. Now, this is a closed system. So eventually, the water level, level evens out. This is equilibrium. The light bulb can't light anymore. This cell would be dead if this was a, a living cell. It basically ran out of reactants. It can no longer do anything. So this would be more like your cell. You're constantly taking in new things. You're constantly giving off products. And so you can continuously convert and, and uh, release energy and light the light bulb think of the light bulb as you being alive. So I kind of like this. It's a very simplified illustration. And remember how yesterday I mentioned that some reactions are not just one step. Think of some reactions like this. That you might, this might be the final product that you need here. But what your cells can do is in a series of steps, break this down. And at each step along the pathway, you can release certain amounts of energy. So this kind of gives you a, I, I kind of like I said, like this analogy, that it kind of shows you how our bodies work. That they're not closed systems, but you have lots of reactions going on all the time. And that the energy released by one reaction could power another reaction. Now, in a living cell, what kind of work do we do? Because we're not lighting light bulbs, obviously, in our cells. There are basically three kinds of work. Chemical work, which is the building and breaking down of molecules, like breaking down sugar in your mitochondria, like building proteins, making hormones, making cell membranes, all that kind of stuff. Transport, like, remember the sodium potassium pump was a kind of work that was transport. And then mechanical, in other words, movement. Your muscles contracting is actual movement, mechanical work. So again, chemical, this is your reactions that are going on in your cells. Transport, like, for example, the NAK sodium potassium pump, things like that, carrying things through. And mechanical, even endocytosis is, is, me is mechanical in a way. A cell surrounds and eats something, and your muscles contracting. Now, all of these things require energy. So to do this, what your cells use is what's called energy coupling, like coupling as in putting together as a couple. The energy from an exergonic reaction is captured and carried to an endergonic reaction, sort of like the water flowing. That energy can be captured and used to light the light bulb. But in a cell, the way that we do that is using ATP. So ATP is the molecule that's going to allow energy from an exergonic reaction to be carried to an endergonic reaction. And so we're going to very briefly, the, actually the next two chapters after this, which are photosynthesis and cell respiration, are much more detailed about ATP. We're just going to do kind of an introduction here of what it is and how it works. So ATP, sorry, I'm just going to need that. Can you see me that slide? So ATP is what we're going to call an energy carrier. Here's what it looks like. You, I think the outline has a picture of this. Here's the important part of ATP. It's really, it's here. The T is for tri. There's three phosphates on ATP. And what can happen is this third phosphate breaks off. And when it does that, the energy is transferred from ATP to some other molecule. If you paid attention in the last chapter, you saw a really good example of this. You saw ATP come in, gave a phosphate, and that phosphate attached to the protein in the sodium potassium pump. And what happened to that protein when the phosphate attached to it? In the sodium potassium pump. Right, the protein literally changed shape and the sodiums could leave. So the phosphate attaching changed the shape of the protein so that the, the sodiums could leave during the sodium potassium pump. So this phosphate, when it breaks off and gets attached to other things, it typically the way it really works is it, it, it sort of oftentimes changes shape and makes that molecule um, more able to react or behave. But the way we simplify it is we basically say that ATP sort of provides energy. It's not technically exactly doing that. So it stands for adenosine triphosphate because there's three phosphates. Ribose is the sugar. Adenine is the base. If you remember back from our biochemistry chapter, um, a sugar, a base, and a phosphate make a nucleotide. So technically what ATP is, is a nucleic acid. Remember carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. ATP is actually a nucleic acid. It's composed of a sugar, a nitrogen base, and then three phosphates. It is what we call an energy carrier molecule, meaning it can shuttle energy from a, an exergonic reaction that releases energy to an endergonic reaction that requires energy. And we can, and again, mentioned on the previous slide, 
This is called energy coupling. In other words, you have ADP, this is diphosphate, and you have a little phosphate here. And what will happen is you have an exergonic reaction that releases energy. And when that energy is given off, what it does is it hooks the phosphate on and makes ATP. Then when ATP turns around and gives away the phosphate, again, going back to ADP, it basically releases that energy. So by it basically carries the energy from one reaction to another. I have a much better picture of this coming up on another slide. But that's how ATP does it. It basically, extragonic reactions release energy, and that hooks the phosphate on. Then you have a reaction that requires energy, the phosphate breaks off and releases the energy. And then it's ready to, to be recycled and do it all over again. Exactly. That's exactly it. So the energy, so that's how it transfers energy. Sort of like if you were playing hot potato. You ever played that game where you pass it and, and you don't, you know, they're going to yell stop and you don't want to be holding it. So you grab it. That would be sort of like me becoming ATP. Now I pass the phosphate to somebody else and I've passed the energy along. And then I can become, I can become ATP again and I can go back to ADP. And it just goes back and forth. So it's constantly being recycled. Um, it passes its third phosphate, the P, the phosphate, to other molecules. And that's how it provides the power to endergonic reactions. There's a word for passing the phosphate along. It sounds complicated. Phosphorylation is a big word, but that's all it means. Phosphorylation just means passing the phosphate. So when ATP, if you remember the sodium potassium pump, hooked its phosphate onto the protein, that was phosphorylation of that protein. And then the protein changed shape. So that is what phosphorylation is. And again, the way that it really works on a technical level, it's not so much that phosphate has a bunch of energy in itself, but there's something about phosphate, that third phosphate breaking off and hooking to something. A lot of times the way it works on a mechanical level is that when that phosphate hooks to something, it changes the shape of that molecule. And for whatever reason, that often allows the molecule in a chemical reaction to react more easily, or in something like a sodium potassium pump or muscle contraction, it's what allows the movement, the change in shape that allows the movement of things. Um, so again, if you remember the sodium potassium pump, this is a really good example of it, that the phosphate of the sodium potassium pump, when it hooked onto the protein, the protein changed shape, and now the sodiums could leave. And then when that phosphate left, it went back to its original shape, and the potassiums, um, so yeah, potassiums came in. Lost my train of thought there. All right, so you, you will not see a picture like this on a test, but this is showing an example of ATP in action. So in this particular reaction, these two things, glutamic acid and ammonia, react. This, the delta G for this reaction is positive 3.4 kilocalories per mole. Can you go through the material? Yeah, please. So that means, is this endergonic or extragonic by itself? Positive delta G. Endergonic. So this reaction requires energy. So here's what ATP does. If ATP is present, ATP will hook a phosphate onto the glutamic acid. And then the ammonia will react with it. Now it turns out that the breaking of the ATP, this step, has a negative 7.3 kilocalories per mole. Exergonic. So if you were going to, and again, you will not have to do this on a test, but if you were going to calculate the total energy when you put the two reactions together, negative 7.3, positive 3.4, the overall reaction when ATP is involved, if we add those two numbers together, is negative 3.9. Notice what's happened is the energy from the ATP allowed the reaction to basically go from being an endergonic reaction to the overall being exergonic. Again, if this confuses you, you will not see a picture like this on a test, but it is kind of a nice way of showing how adding ATP, the energy released from that, sort of provides the energy for an endergonic reaction to happen. 